ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Retro Culture presents the Hooptober Tapes, a special event for the spooky season. Hooptober Ocho, Tape 3. Greetings and welcome, grown-ups, kiddies, glitches in the Matrix, and the Gremlins after midnight. Welcome to the third edition of the Hooptober Tapes for 2021. I'm your host, Brett, the voice without body, and today I am wrapping up my personal side of the Hooptober tapings that being recorded on Halloween proper. I still have one episode left, possibly two, but that will be a collaborative effort between myself and the bestie, Tyler, that wasted warrior from previous years and outings. But today, I have not one, not two, not three, not four, not even five, but eight titles to wrap up for my personal Hooptober viewing. And oh boy, is that a lot to deal with. So we're just going to jump right on into it and start out with the first title discussed today will be 2018's Malevolent, directed by one Olaf de la Fleur, and starring Florence Pugh, Ben Lloyd Hughes, Georgina Bevan, Scott Chambers, Celia Emery, and James Cosmo. Now, Malevolent concerns siblings Jackson and Angela, played by Ben Lloyd Hughes and Florence Pugh, respectively, who run a profitable ghost-busting racket, swindling the bereaved with fake detection equipment and Angela's paranormal visions. Hired to investigate a haunted old foster home, the team uncovers its terrifying past. Young girls brutally slaughtered, mouths stitched shut, silenced by a sadistic killer, and Angela's on the edge, sleepless, strung out, and possibly losing her mind, no longer certain what's actually real. She is convinced she hears the girls crying out to her from the darkness, for real this time. Of course, Jackson doesn't really believe her, seeing as they've been on this job for years and years at this point. But it turns out supernatural terrors are the least of their problems when they discover a very real evil lurking in this isolated manner. Now, Malevolent fulfills the requirement for myself of being a haunted house movie and for this Hooptober. And I went into this movie with very few expectations. I merely am a big fan of Florence Pugh, so I decided to seek it out because, oh, well, she'll at least be good in it. And the only thing I noticed before I went into it was that it had, uh, was on the lower end of the average ratings on my Hooptober uh, listicle. Now, this premise, I think, has some really solid potential behind it. Uh, the idea of uh, paranormal fakery uh, that later transitions into belief, skepticism turning from, well, that much, skepticism into belief is a really neat, like, arc. And especially when it's, when it's played with a character like that of Angela, a person who has made a living off of, ooh, being this applauded, uh, just fake mystic, this fake medium who can see things and comfort people by acting it out well. But when they dis but when this type of character discovers they might actually have some potential in that area, like not just in not just in acting terms, but actually in the but actually in the terms of oh, I might actually have some ability here. It, it, it's a really neat premise. I think it has solid potential behind it. And it's just a shame the movie can't really follow up on that very well when it becomes just very generic for the most part. That said, uh, some of the... Uh, most of the performances are really well, especially that of Florence Pugh. Florence Pugh is one of the most engaging screen presences these days. Uh, not just from her Pretty good work in Midsummer. Not a movie I'm a fan of, but I'm also really big on her from the likes of uh, Greta Gerwig's Little Women, especially. I 
was a massive fan of the work she put in in uh, Greta Gerwig's Little Women as she did a magnificent job playing Amy March, a character who has been much maligned in most of the adaptations of the work in particular, but Florence Pugh really did a grand job humanizing Amy March in those in that particular film. Now, with Malevolent, again, Florence Pugh is easily the standout, although Celia Emery, as the house matron of the old foster home they're investigating, also has some pretty good tendencies that she works with as this borderline, stereotypical, creepy, just homeowner. But she pulls off, well, now... I do have some problems with the character played by Ben Lloyd Hughes. Now, Ben Lloyd Hughes plays the character of Jackson, the one who is the the quote-unquote showrunner when it comes to this ghost-busting racket they run. And boy, he's a bastard in this. And there's a fine line between playing a bastard as like, oh, wow, you're just really good at playing this compared to okay, you're actually really annoying right now. And unfortunately, Ben Lloyd Hughes crosses that line a few times in the movie. And it's so odd because Florence Pugh is doing such good work counterbalancing him most of the time. There's a really good scene when right after their cameraman becomes injured, they're about to go downstairs. They're about to, like, uh, fit a ladder to go downstairs. And Ben Lloyd Hughes is all like, what, you don't trust me? And Florence Pugh has a really good aside about, look... Look, I remember that tree incident back when we were six. My knee still wobbles funny. And it's like, that's a really good piece of, like, background for these characters. Because you, you just put input little things like that that really make this brother-sister pairing really, really, like, spark. But, man, Ben Lloyd Hughes just is a... He's a really astounding jackass in this movie. Plus, it doesn't help that... It's apparent that he's in debt to various awful figures, which is why he's all the more adamant about carrying through this job to the end. Eh, Malevolent is not a... It is not the worst film I saw for this challenge by far, but it was fairly disappointing given how I thought the premise could easily have paid off in good dividends. But, eh, things can't always go the way you want. But if you would like to see Malevolent, it is currently streaming on Netflix, as it is a one of those Netflix originals that we all hear so much about and then promptly forget for various reasons. Content! But that will wrap up my first title. Moving on to the second of eight today. We are talking 2021's Demonic. Directed by Neil Blomkamp and featuring the talents of Carly Pope. Chris William Martin, Candice McClure, Terry Chen, Michael J. Rogers, and Angela Boltz. Now, the story of Demonic concerns a woman named Carly, who is plagued by dreams of her mother, who years ago murdered her way through some medical institutions she worked at and was thereafter imprisoned in an institution. Twenty years later, an old friend, Martin, meets up with Carly to explain that he recently saw her mother in a coma at a nearby hospital. Upon visiting the hospital, operated by a mysterious organization called Therapol, Carly indeed discovers her mother in a coma, but hooked up to a computerized device in addition, and watched closely by two men, one of which a medical professional. They have devised a way for people to enter the dreamscape of coma patients, and they want Carly to go in and talk to her mother. Hesitant at first, Carly agrees to participate in their new technological marvel, but once she enters the experimental environment, something attached to her mother awakens and sets its eyes on Carly. And that's the, the synopsis I'll give for Neil Blomkamp's Demonic so far, a movie that I initially added to my watch this because, oh, it's a new Neil Blomkamp movie, and hey, this is the guy who did District 9 and Chappie. Of course I'm gonna see what he what he did next. And this movie is kind of odd because it is one of those many movies that uh, various creative types made in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, Neil Blomkamp was stuck in Canada and decided to make a just small little horror film. 
with uh, whatever resources he could haggle together. I was actually really intrigued by that. I really think sometimes limiting directors, putting them in sort of like a compact situation and limiting their resources, sometimes means not the best of them. I think most directors' first films they made with really nothing are some of their best films. Hell, that's what I think of like uh, the Wachowskis with Bound. I think Bound's an excellent movie. Possibly their best in my opinion, but that's just me. <sighs> Unfortunately, Demonic is a collection of missed opportunities with some standout moments and ideas that are played with, but unfortunately not followed up on fully. Uh, I'll start with my positives. I personally think the use of virtual environments in this movie is one of the best I've seen. Instead of being a clear, concise, just spotless looking virtual environment the virtual reality environment showcased in demonic is very reminiscent of modern like vr capabilities this place is full of artifacts the the uh monitors of the people above world watching the characters within the world are is, is, an, is a very isometric view very limited in capability of what they're able to participate and watch on the side and the fact that the avatars used for the characters inside the virtual are almost like part rotoscoped and just grainy and like pixelated that is a really good touch because most movies i've seen involving virtual reality really just shoot the actors in live action environments and then add in cg and enhancements in the background and while that's not terrible, I, I love this very grounded approach to how a virtual environment would look at first when it's first introduced. Because, let's face it, very current VR is buggy. And this virtual environment also looks buggy. And that is really realistic. I really dug the way Neil Blomkamp decided to realize this particular look for his virtual environment as limited as he turns out to use it in the production. There are only really three instances where they enter the environment and all of them last less than 10 minutes, sometimes no more than five. So in this movie that's still approximately 90 minutes, you've maybe got a sixth of it takes place in this promising environment that is actually really well realized for my money. But, unfortunately, that's probably the best thing I can say about it. Uh, another missed opportunity. I'm going to do my best to avoid spoilers, seeing as very few people have seen this movie. I, I'm, I think I'm the only one in my I immediate friend group who has seen it. Uh, I know my, uh, my two cent trivia people, none of them have seen that. And that's an odd feeling, knowing that I've seen something they haven't. But there was a specific reveal about a little over halfway in involving the true identity of Therapol, the mysterious organization that is currently made in the hospital. And when that reveal dropped, myself and my godson, who were watching this, uh, sort of giggled aloud like, oh, this is where it's going? All right. Cool, where is this heading? And unfortunately, that reveal really goes nowhere. They drop something that promises to be crazy awesome. And then the next time that pop up comes up, oh, it's been cold. It's like, oh. Oh, you really had nothing. Oh, damn. Wow. It's like, wow, Neil. Like, you, you bring out this really interesting little wrinkle. Like, ooh, that's an interesting... Uh, new uh, uh, archetype to bring into this. How are you going to utilize it? He doesn't. And the, the acting is, is fine. There's a lot of it feels very amateurish, which again, I'm taking into account this is a micro-budgeted production produced during COVID. So I'm giving it a lot of benefits of the doubt, and the fact that I'm giving it Relatively good marks for its ver for its visuals in terms of the virtual environment. Unfortunately, that is the high water mark because otherwise, 
this movie feels very toothless in many regards. It doesn't even feel like Neil really cares about horror that much because the demonicness of the movie is basically just an evolved afterthought. Like, it's there, but there's there's really no lore to this demonic presence. There's only some throwaways, like, I've done some research about this, and this is what I found. But even then, it's really just bare bones, broad strokes. Talks about, ah, oh, this demon likes to do this. It's like, and there's nothing really about its origin. Only that it looks like a... It looks vaguely like Songbird from from Bioshock Infinite, but colored entirely black. So, giant chicken demon of sorts. And unfortunately, this movie just isn't terribly memorable, aside from choices it makes but refuses to follow up on, and its virtual environments. And one of the things that really haggles me about this is the odd placement of this in Neil Blomkamp's progression. Because in, in many ways, Demonic feels like this would be a first film. This is something that a director would make when they really have no resources and they're trying to make a calling card. And then possibly some studio execs would catch up on this and say, oh, well, that looks pretty interesting. He can do some, he can make something with nothing. All right. And then they hand him something like Chappie, which honestly feels more, more appropriate for a second feature. And then you follow it up with something like Elysium, which is bloated and doesn't quite work, but it's memorable. And then you finally culminate in District 9. This Neil Blomkamp's directorial progression feels completely wrong. How did he break out with District 9? And then just each progressive movie is just diminishing returns or diminishing returns to the point that we now have Demonic, easily his weakest film. And it's like, oh man, there are spots where this could easily go places, but because of various uh, because of various things coming together at the wrong time in the wrong place, he just can't make it work. And I'm still going to give Neil Blomkamp benefit of the doubt, hopefully with, maybe his next movie will be excellent. God, I hope so. I was just incredibly disappointed with how he he had promise with this film. He gave little tidbits of, ooh, that looks like an interesting bit. How are you going to follow up on it? And just nothing, unfortunately. And unfortunately, I cannot give a recommend to Neil Blomkamp's Money. It is available for rental from most rental platforms. You go, I rented it from Google Play and watched it on YouTube. So, and I think I'm, it's also available on like Amazon and Vudu. So it is available for rental, but... Again, besides little technical elements that I believe are worth checking it out for, there's really not much to recommend for Demonic, unfortunately. And that follows us up to our third title being discussed today, that being 1981's Venom, directed by Pierce Haggard and starring the talents of Klaus Kinski, Susan George, Sterling Hayden, Nicole Williamson, Oliver Reed, and a brief appearance from Michael Goff. Uh, Venom story is about in London, England, the international criminal international criminal Jacques Muller, played by Klaus Kinski, arrives in London, England, summoned by his girlfriend Louise Andrews, a local housemaid, to kidnap her charge young Philip Hopkins, the ten-year-old grandson of Howard Anderson, played by Sterling Hayden, a retired American hunter and the wealthy owner of an international hotel chain. Louise, working as the maid for Philip's widowed mother, has seduced the chauffeur, Dave Everconnelly, played by Oliver Reed, convincing him to help her in the kidnapping. On the day of the kidnapping, Muller tricks Howard and Ruth into leaving home while Louise and Dave kidnap the boy. But said kidnapping plans go awry when Philip leaves the row house briefly to retrieve a pet snake, which is accidentally swapped with a venomous African black mamba meant for toxicologist Dr. Marion Stowe, portrayed by Sarah Miles. Howard returns home early, and when Philip returns, the black mamba is accidentally released from its container by Louise, biting her in the face three times before fleeing into the ventilation system. Muller and Dave quickly take Philip and Howard hostage, while Louise lies agonized by the Black Mamba's venom on the floor. 
Dr. Stowe contacts the police, having discovered the mix-up, and a police officer is dispatched to the Hopkins residence. However, as upon arriving, the officer is shot and killed by Dave with one of Howard's hunting rifles, the officer managing to call for backup before he collapses close to death. More police arrive, led by Commander William Bullock, uh, the glorious man that is Nicole Williamson. And after learning of the hostages, Bullock has the streets sealed off and begins negotiations with Muller, initially refusing to give in to the demands for transportation and one million pound spread across different currencies. That evening, with the siege of the house underway, Dr. Stowe arrives with a case of anti-venom and informs Bullock of the Black Mamba inside the house and the dangers within. Bullock and Dr. Stowe warn both the kidnappers and the hostages of the dangers they're in, but within the walls, no one can truly prepare for the mayhem about to ensue. And that is the description for Venom I'll leave off at. A very neat little high concept in sorts. Uh, this movie is basically a home invasion hostage thriller crossed with a animals wreak havoc uh, movie. Because, yeah, it's, it's a hostage movie, but with a black mamba thrown in to mix up the affair. And it, it, it's honestly quite fun. Uh, I have actually been aware of this movie from my days trawling the internet on uh, the likes of videodetective.com, where where there were, right, right around the same time Apple movie trailers were taking off, Video Detective had a lot of old-school, like, B-movie shit that I was very interested in, fresh off seeing shit like The Fly and... Uh, uh, various other pulpy fairs, and for some reason, this movie's trailer stuck with me in that it opened with like the wide eyes of Oliver Reed, like claiming about the danger he's in, and he he starts like hyperventilating. And I could have swore the movie was trailer was edited so that it appears that every time the snake bit someone, they they slow they exploded. I don't know where that came from because that is actually nowhere in this movie, but. It's still a pretty fun affair overall. You've got crazy Klaus Kinski going like, Yes, this, this child will be mine and I will make, make the money and leave. It's, it's, it's fun enough. And apparently he and Oliver Reed were at each other's throats off screen, like off camera. So it adds a really, really hostile dynamic between the two of them. And plus you've got Nicole Williamson as the Take Snow takes no bullshit police commander on the job who really wants this to end well but he knows he's probably going to have to deal with some bloodshed before the night is over he's just hoping it doesn't involve the victims proper it, it, this movie's really fun it's it, it's a hostage thriller with, with, uh, with a big old snake thrown in there and there's plenty of actually solid suspense in here I am very unfamiliar with Pierce Haggard Boy, I feel I've heard his name pop up places before. Well, apparently Venom was initially supposed to be directed by Toby Hooper, but he was immediately replaced by the likes of Pierce Haggard for various reasons. Now, Pierce Haggard, uh, he's best known for being additional crew on Michelangelo Antonioni's Blow Up. And he directed the BBC production of Pennies from Heaven, but... Oh, he also directed The Blood on Satan's Claw. That's a movie in my backlog I really needed to catch up on. But yeah, I don't want to say too much about Venom because a lot of the fun to be had is discovered by those who give it a watch. So I will simply say if you perhaps are a fan of Oliver Reed and Klaus Kinski, or even Sterling Hayden, he has a really nice meaty part in here. That This is the type of movie that if made today, I would expect most of these people to be here and gone within a few minutes because you can't really afford to have the big stars take up the time. That money is money is too easily spent on big name like character actors and shit. So a lot of productions have to con consolidate that and uh, cut back on the scenes they can put them in as a result. But this one's actually solid, like '80s B movie with plenty of good good things for the cast to do and just. A really fun concept and yeah I'm gonna recommend you guys check it out I personally watched it on my personal DVD copy which for some reason well I can tell what the reason is it's paired up with Bruno Mattei's Rats Night of Terror which I noted in my uh, letterbox review um Venom is more of a movie 
than uh, Rats Night of Terror. Like, I have had this personal philosophy that there is a difference between honest-to-God professional filmmakers and people who just happen to make feature films. For example, the latter, think of the shit that Red Letter Media watches on Best of the Worst. Like, the, the, Venom is an actually pro, pro, professionally produced movie. Meanwhile, Rats Night of Terror is literally a ripoff made on leftover sets they, the Italians had for various post-apocalyptic Western movies they had. And just questionable acting decisions, even more questionable special effects sequences. Meanwhile, Venom is so professionally maintained and sculpted. It's a movie. And sometimes you just want to watch a movie during Hooptober, and Venom is there to provide if you so wish. Now, if you're interested in watching it, it is currently available to stream on the 2B TV service with ad interruptions, but if you, um... <clears throat> perhaps have a uh, good enough browser with some add-ons, perhaps you can watch it without those ads. Uh, it is also available on the Night Flight streaming service. I think that things come up before on this podcast series. But well, I might have to... I'm intrigued by this, even the title, so I'll have to figure out where it is. It is also available for rent on the Alamo On Demand streaming service, as well as Amazon, Vudu, and iTunes. And that will wrap up my discussion of Venom. And next up in line, we have... Ooh, this is an interesting one. 1992's Tetsuo 2, Body Hammer. Written, produced, and directed by Shinya Tsukamoto. And starring Tomaro Taguchi, Nobu, Nobu Kanaoka, Kenosuke Tomioka, and Shinya Tsukamoto. Now, Tetsuo 2, Body Hammer. Plot summary for such. Three years after the metal fetishist's initial nightmarish transformation in Tetsuo, question mark, question mark, question mark, the ordinary and unassuming salaryman, Taniguchi Tomo, is injected with some odd metallic substance as a kidnapping attempt is made on his young son, Minori. The attempt is unsuccessful, however, but later on, the perpetrating skinheads make a second attempt, successful this time, that prompts a an odd transformation on the part of the usually meek and restrained Taniguchi. Forced to unleash his dormant destructive power, Tomo embraces the cathartic effect of his ultimate metamorphosis as his naked rage transforms the once feeble flesh into a grisly symbiosis of soft tissue and hard metal. Who dares to stand in the way of this new ultimate body hammer of destruction? What about the mysterious guy who seems enraptured and excited by this new player in his twisted game of twisted metal? And what does he have to do with Taniguchi? Uh, that is the synopsis I'll give for Tetsuo 2 Body Hammer, a film which actively fulfills... Uh, it is the final of the Asian horrors, the final part of the trilogy of Asian horrors I was to serve up for this year's October, as well as a year from my year of birth, that being the year 1992, an okay year for horror, in my opinion. Now, I suppose I should start about this talking about my initial thoughts on Tetsuo, even though I did bring them up last year, I believe it might have been the first thing me and Tyler discussed together for last year's October. First Tetsuo, in the past year since I've seen it, I've actually grown to really adore Tetsuo. I think Tetsuo, the, the Iron Man, might be the ultimate pure body horror experience as I personally feel challenged by body horror a lot of times but in the best way I feel it is it, it rocks someone like me to their core and makes me reassess what does this too too solid flesh actually mean at the end of things perhaps it's a bit too philosophical for my means but that's what I have I really love the aesthetic of Tetsuo the Iron Man I really really love the just gung-ho attitude Tsukamoto brought to those proceedings, and what he was able to do with just so little in terms of resources. It, again, it's one of those things, like I mentioned with Neil Blomkamp earlier, I really love seeing what directors can do when their backs are to the wall and they really only have what they have available to them at this very moment. No grand resources, and they're basically shooting on weekends, probably, for the most part, or just immediately when they're not working, to save up funds. Now, Tetsuo 2 Body Hammer is interesting in that the movie I can best relate it to in terms of progression is, weirdly enough, Evil Dead 2. 
because this, in theory, is a sequel. However, um, the salary man at the center of this is played by the exact same guy as was in the original Tetsuo, uh, Tomoro Taguchi. Uh, at the beginning of this, he is not a metal tank driving down the front, driving down the highways and byways of Tokyo, uh, launching projectiles into meaningless space and harassing the populace with his uh, new boy toy, the metal fetishist, fused in at his torso. Uh, it, it's, it's a sequel, but the way I look at it, it's a follow-up slash remake slash reimagining of sorts. In the, in the same vein as Evil Dead 2, which, if you look at all the Evil Dead movies, they all sort of change the story slightly as they progress. Evil Dead 2 consolidates the first Evil Dead into like eight minutes and then picks up immediately afterwards. Um, this serves very similarly, even though it is much more spread out. It is not an immediate, like, oh, the the first bit of the, f the first film is basically consolidated the first half. No, that's not really it. There's a lot more going on here. There is now a an expanded cult of metal worshippers. This now being portrayed by skinheads, interestingly enough. There is also a mad scientist who has created this new metallic formula that, when injected, will transform people into metal benders? Question mark? It, 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 it seems like they just get a bit thicker and uh, hardier, but it's nothing compared... Tanaguchi, who seemingly is just a regular Kinshiro, and he just can blast through anyone that you put in front of him. Uh, it, it's so odd, and it's... They decided to add a family dynamic into this film, which is an interesting choice, given how the first one was very isolated. It was just the salaryman, his girlfriend, and the metal fetishist were the only major characters, apart from that weird woman who stalked the salaryman in the subway, who was actually my favorite character. Uh, Kei Fujiwara's performance in the original Tetsuo is possibly one of my favorite performances I saw last year, because she was crazy good. Emphasis on crazy. This sequel f does a lot of things well as a follow-up. I was actually worried going into this because I was worried it wouldn't be able to stand up to the original, just how much that one blew my socks off, even though I kind of knew what to expect with Tetsuo 1, having seen multiple effects and clip shows on YouTube in years past. But Tetsuo 2 works really well. It, it's an expansion on the initial premise, and it adds some new dynamics to play with the family dynamic, the haunted past of the characters that's not just, oh, I ran over a homeless dude and he cursed me with this metal acne. Uh, there's, there's more going on here. The, the effects budget is clearly upped. They're playing a lot more with interesting new prosthetics. Held, of course, uh, Shinji Tsukamoto also still has his innate love of stop-motion animation where he plays with all those wi the wire work. And uh, very KMB-esque, the effects work in this. Uh, and that's really something worth pointing out. And actually, I don't want to give too much away because like the first Tetsuo, it's best if you go in as blind as possible and just let it wash over you because this is a technological nightmare. But if you have the stomach for it, I believe it's rewarding. It gives you a fun little genre piece that is often what I come to horror and sci-fi for. So take that as you will. I personally rented Tetsuo on iTunes, but it is available on the Arrow streaming site, which I also just uh, logged into the other day. So it is able to stream on the Arrow player and is available to rent from, as I mentioned, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube for relatively cheap, I might say. Hell, I got the YouTube, the iTunes uh, rental for only 99 cents. And as of uh, looking at it right now, it is also still 99 cents to rent on iTunes. So, hey, if you're in the mood for it, I recommend it. And that will move us on to the next title in the Hooptober Rundown, that being 2021's Halloween Kills. Directed by David Gordon Green, written by David Gordon Green, as well as Scott Teams and Danny McBride. And starring Jamie Lee Curtis, Judy Greer, Andy Matichak, Kyle Richards, Thomas Mann, Will Patton, James Jude Courtney, and Anthony Michael Hall. The premise of Halloween Kills. This is an immediate follow-up of 2018's Halloween, directed by David Gordon Green. Mere minutes after Laurie Strode, Jamie Lee Curtis, her daughter Karen, Judy Greer, and granddaughter Allison, Andy Matichak, 
left masked monster Michael Myers caged and burning in Lori's basement. Lori is rushed to the hospital with life-threatening injuries, believing she has finally killed her lifelong tormentor. But when firefighters follow up on the burning household they trapped Michael in, Michael manages to escape, beginning yet another ritual bloodbath on Halloween night. As Lori fights her pain and prepares to defend herself against Myers, Haddonfield rises up against this unstoppable monster. The Strode women join a group of other survivors of Michael's first rampage all the way back in 78, who decide to take matters into their own hands, forming a vigilante mob that sets out to hunt Michael down once and for all. And that is the premise of Halloween Kills that I'll give for this moment. I am actually a rather big fan of the original Halloween, as well as the follow-up that David Gordon Green did back in 2018. I'll admit, I have not revisited it since I saw it in the theater, but I was riding a high coming out of that film. I was Part of it was the fact I was glad this was so much better than so many of the sequels I've seen, with a couple exceptions. I was so happy to see John Carpenter's name up on a big screen again, not just as a screenwriter credit, but he did the score for the, for not only 2018, but also this, this particular one as well. I really thought Andy Matichak held her own alongside Judy Greer and the ethereal Jamie Lee Curtis. I was glad to see Nick Castle getting work again ever since the first one. I thought the kill, the throwbacks to the original were neat. The initial scene where Michael is let loose on the neighborhood again is genuinely terrifying to my eyes and effective. And that left me with a lot of hope that this new entry would be something that would be a, well, a worthy follow-up. Um, what to say about Halloween Kills? Uh, I'm gonna be honest, I was kind of let down by this, guys. And girls. And ghouls. And ghosts. This film missed a lot of marks that I felt were fairly easy to follow up on. And I can see how... It's obvious David Gordon Green and Danny McBride and Scott Teams did not want to get caught in the trap of just making Halloween 2 again, seeing as Laurie Strode's been injured, she has to go to the hospital, Michael Myers has to make his way to the hospital, such. So they did their best to get around that, but in doing so, the way they decided to pad out that storyline with Michael not actually following up on the hospital, their heart is in the right place, but... The way the screenplay plays out, the way the story in particular plays out, it feels like, A, teams McBride and Green do deeply misunderstand the genre they're working in, thinking they can uh, sow a message into this gleeful slasher film filled with outrageous gore effects that are showcased front and center, and also they deeply mistrust their audience. Hence, they insert that message in order to say things like, hey, maybe mob mentality is bad. It's like, first of all, that's not terribly original. There was there was a mob of vigilantes in Halloween 4, the return of Michael Myers. This, this is not new. In theory, the effects work on the kills of Halloween Kills are pretty well managed. They're really good, but there are some that just don't work given the fact that they're trying to make a message movie. There is a particular scene involving the mob justice that lingers on a victim and it's at that point that myself and my godson in the theater looked at each other like what is this trying to do this this is not something you focus on and like wow look at these great effects we made it's like this is tragic you don't the rules are you don't show this what is wrong with you it, there's there's such a weird mishmash going on in halloween kills it's it doesn't work and it also feels like it's trying very hard to crib harder into nostalgia of that initial Halloween night. Which, again, is an odd choice. How we bring back in Kyle Richards, who was the original Lindsay back in the original movie. We also brought back in the nurse, Marianne Chambers, as, as the nurse. Who obviously, after having her car stolen, just stuck around Haddonfield for some odd reason. Even though the first ho the the first re revisit from David Gordon Green established that at least uh, Allison's friends were very unaware of the Michael Myers legend, so it's it's odd that the kids would not be. Uh, it's it's just so odd, so many odd choices that feel retroactive, corrective, and overcorrective as a result to the point that it becomes just a mess. There are some instances where the the film works okay. The the initial 
Michael Rampage against the firefighters, as well as that first home he invades, is really chilling and really effective. Elements of the score by John Carpenter and Cody, and their... Oh, who the hell is their third collaborator? Uh, Daniel Davies is the, the third collaborator in the Carpenter triplet. It, it, it has moments where the music works, but it's only when the, the movie's trying to go for emotion, which, when it does, it usually misses, and then it immediately just shotguns itself in the foot almost immediately afterward, oddly enough. There are so many ways this movie could have worked so damn well, and... I'm going to be honest, I've sort of lost a bit of my enthusiasm for Halloween Ends as a result because this was a bad misstep. And this is only made worse by the fact that the day Halloween Kills released, it was announced that David Gordon Green had an alternate cut in the can for Halloween Kills with a new ending. And that just tells me David Gordon Green could not figure out what he wanted to do with the second movie. Even though when this was first announced, when this project was first announced, they initially were going to shoot two movies back to back, but they decided to wait it out. But as a result of that waiting, they seem to have lost some of their nerve in terms of what they were going to dedicate to. And it's even more weird how they've announced that the next, the final movie in this trilogy, Halloween Ends, will deal with timely issues like a global pandemic. And I'm like, oh no, seeing how they've already tried to deal with timely events and Halloween Kills, I'm honestly worried is the best way I can put it. That's like the nicest way I could put it. I'm unenthused and worried, but I'm just sticking it out because I want to hear I want to support John Carpenter's scores being out there when I really should just listen to them on Spotify, but Halloween Kills. It, it's currently playing in theaters. It's currently showing on Peacock. I don't recommend it because there's really not much to recommend in this, unfortunately. Even, like, seeing old hat Carpenter players like Charles Cypher show up in movies, going like, oh, shit, he's back! Lee Brackett's back in the movie, but it's like, oh, god damn it. There's, there's so many, just... It doesn't help that the the nostalgia they ed they edge towards just doesn't really work. The, 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 the dialogue callbacks are really bad in this one. There's one when they... When Lee, Sheriff Lee former Sheriff Lee Brackett pulls out one from the 78 and I'm like this is not the time for this this does not fit you were only putting this in here because it was in the original movie god damn it David Gordon Green and Danny McBride you're also not up the hook and Scott teams I, I guess too not a big fan I, one can hope the final one will be better but god it's hard to keep up hope these days with certain projects uh, moving on, the sixth title to talk about today will be Valerian Borechik's 1981 film Dr. Jekyll et les Femmes, released internationally as The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Miss Osborne, starring the talented actors Udo Kier, Marina Piero, Patrick McGee, Howard Vernon, and Gerard Zalkberg. In Victorian London, the esteemed Dr. Jekyll has just recently been engaged to one Miss Fanny Osborne and is holding a party with several esteemed guests, dancers, relatives, a general, a priest, and a few medical acquaintances of Jekyll's. But outside, a terrible crime has just been committed. A young girl, not even ten years of age, has been beaten almost to death and narrowly avoided a fate worse than death. Shortly after this renouncement, Jekyll pulls aside a family friend to dictate his will, establishing a person known only to the doctor as Edward Hyde to be his sole inheritor if anything should happen. But the night soon collapses into anarchic terror when the young dancer present is found raped and murdered inside the house they're residing, and it appears someone is stalking the household, wreaking havoc on this unsuspecting crowd of well-to-dos with a particularly penetrative instrument of terror. I came to this movie knowing of its reputation for a while. I've had tangential run-ins with Valerian Borochik, particularly through my internet critics. I've seen various interactions with his, I believe it was 1975 film, The Beast, which is sort of a Beauty and the Beast movie, kind of, but really it's more of the Wolfman, sort of. Interestingly enough, this film was initially announced and portrayed by Mr. Borochik as... 
Oh, it's an adaptation. I found the lost manuscript of the first draft of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It's the one they couldn't release. And that brings it some sort of, you know, n notorious injury. Like, oh, really? What? What was so sultry they couldn't put in the original novel? And that sort of brings about the... I guess the sort of sense of fun Borochik is trying to have with the material, even though this is a dark movie. Oh god, there is so much sexual assault in this thing. It's borderline pornographic. Like, you've literally got the camera just zooming in on, like, vaginas and cocks and all sorts of, like, woof. There are... There is so much genitalia in this movie. It's legitimately... I could see why people would not finish this movie, because it seems leering at times in its approach. That said, I have some thoughts on this movie as obvious, but let's start off with the cast. Uh, uh, Marina Piero is is actually pretty good as our leading lady, Fanny Osborne, who is by default the point of view character. Seeing as Udo Kier basically disappears the movie at times for <laughs> reasons we'll get into. She does pretty well, even if it becomes very obvious that Borochik wrote his women in one of three modes. A helpless, horny, or a hopeless combination of those two. Which is disappointing, though I have the feeling uh, this particular auteur was taking aim at socio-sexual mores of the Victorians more than making a blanket statement on the fairer sex. So, I am not nearly intelligent enough to get into that, but I'll just point it out and move on. Now let's talk about... It was really neat to see Patrick McGee pop up in this. That is a character actor that whenever I see, I'm always prepared to give him some scorn based on previous experiences I've had with him with the likes of A Clockwork Orange and uh, Lucio Fucci's The Black Cat. Released actually the very same year, 1981. Which actually this fulfills that requirement on my Hooptober. This is my fourth and final 1981 film I caught up with, as well as my final country. This is a French production, so country number six out of six. Yes! Success. This movie's dark and dreary, and Udo Kier is very convincing as the impotent adjacent Dr. Jekyll, but I was really disappointed as he was not double casted as the Hyde persona. Instead, they just cast a second actor who has a very repugnant face and air about him to play Hyde. And I'm like, oh man, I want to see Udo Kier play Hyde. God damn it. I love Udo Kier. It's delightful whenever he, pour, whenever he pours his stuff into this. But this movie is effective at souring you. In that, like the pool of transformative liquid at the gooey center of this affair, it, it seeps into you and affects your, your mood. I would say, I watched this before going to work, and I was like, wow, this I knew this movie was going to be tough. Notably, the, the score that's at play here. Uh, a very dour, synthesized work of Bernardo Parmigiani. A lot of dreary overhang on this, and the rapacious fervor will certainly turn off a lot of viewers of this, but the thing is, it is a really effective at being a horror film. It's disgusting, and potentially irreversible, but it does change you. I personally caught up with this on the Arrow player, and if you're in the mood for a challenging psychosexual work, oh boy, uh, feel free to check it out on Arrow player as well, as you could rent it from the typical usual suspects. You can rent it from Google Play, YouTube, and Amazon for a relatively cheap price. Again, that comes with a word of warning. It's this movie is not for everybody. It is a little bit way a little bit rapacious for its own good, but again, I think it's an effective horror film, and not all horror is meant to be enjoyable. Some horror is actually just meant to be horrific, so that's my defense of it for now. And the second to last title to be discussed on this potentially second to last episode of the Hooptober Tapes Volume Ocho will be 1937's Song at Midnight. Ultimately translated as Midnight Song, Singing at Midnight, or literally Midnight Voice. Released uh, in China uh, through the pinyin uh, pronunciation Yeban Gesheng, directed by Mashi Weban. The film stars Ping Yu, Shang Jin, Wenzhi Zhu, Menge, 
G, Chao Xi, and Wang Wei. The story of Song at Midnight, it's a combination of a couple of universal backgrounds. We'll get to that in a second. The story concerns a traveling theatrical troupe, the Angel Theatrical Troupe. Stops by in this dusty old town that seems to be haunted at at midnight by a mysterious songster. And as they stop at the dusty old theater to perform, they are very disgruntled at the, the state of disrepair it is in. However, they decide to carry on the show and clean up as they go in order because the show must go on after all. Uh, one of the young male performers, uh, he's brand new to the stage and he, show, and he has great potential, but unfortunately he has trouble with his song learning and therefore he has much to learn in that regard. But it is lucky for him that the caretaker of the theater arranges that this young potential, this young ingenue is to be tutored and guided by a mysterious figure, the aforementioned songster, a former opera star who was allegedly killed due to political reasons many years ago. The mysterious figure is also, unfortunately, a tragic monster, as his torturous almost death left him disfigured and disgruntled. Still living in the town is his lover, who went insane. Upon hearing about his death. Also at at play is the leader of the current day theater group who was the mastermind behind the torture of this mysterious figure all in the name of seducing his lover. And that in a nutshell is the storyline of Song at Midnight. Commonly best known for being released as China's first horror film. Even though there are a few asterisks attached to that for it must be known that China has some mores that seemingly are never broken. For example, they really dislike supernatural phenomena, so therefore a lot of movies do not get released over there that are fantasy or sci-fi ilk in particular. They make their own that are overseen by the national by the national party and approved and so on. Uh, now, no, those of you who pay attention to the plot would say this sounds quite a bit like Fan of the Opera, and in some ways you are right. With a little bit of Romeo and Juliet thrown in there, sort of, and that there's a star-crossed lover storyline, but it's not completely like like Romeo and Juliet. It's it's closer to Phantom than it is to, to Shakespeare. Though, interestingly enough, the climax of the film also borrows a fair bit from James Whale's Frankenstein. The ending involving a key figure in the plot being chased into a... Oh, I think it's a lighthouse? But it's very reminiscent of the windmill burning sequence from the end of James Wells' original Frankenstein, even ending with the figures seemingly perishing when the fire reaches them and they just toss themselves into the river. It's 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 a unique hybrid of multiple parents, to put it to put it quite succinctly. And in order to make this film work, uh, the director Wiebang Mashu. Uh, had to do a lot of creative behind the scenes, uh, basically pleasing of various parties in order to even get the film made, since, as I said, China is very uh, strict when it comes to what can be portrayed on what time. And interestingly enough, this was also, uh, in China, the most popular cultural adaptation of The Phantom of the Opera, seeming as it was the first sound horror film, the first horror film to achieve a mainstream release in China, aside from certain imports. And it's also notable for several songs included. It, it, uh, 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 there is even a separate section on the Wikipedia entry for seeing as uh, other horror films at the time weren't musicals at the same time, so this is quite the interesting combination effect. And the three songs uh, used in the film were co-written by Tian Han and Xiang Xinghai. And hell, even on the Wikipedia, it also takes note of when, of the time code, when each song appears in the film. Because there are three songs. Song at Midnight, a particular song, uh, Lovers of the Yellow River, and Hot Blood. A, basically the equivalent of Don Juan Triumphant uh, for this particular Phantom adaptation. A lot of reviews will point out that this is also a propaganda piece in that it is clearly made by someone who wishes for possibly a revolution in China's future. You know, things of that nature that may or may not have come to pass in a decade or so following. 
Um, yeah, this movie's pretty okay for the most part. It's it's worth more interest as a historical piece than it is an actual working piece of entertainment, especially in the West. Uh, there are several movies that I participate in and, and, and partake in that I have to admit there are several cultural differences, being that I am mostly of Western mind. I have been raised by very little of Eastern persuasion, especially that from China. I have been raised more by proper Japanese animation and uh, some Chinese action films, like those involving Jackie Chan and John Woo in particular. But I have yet to delve fully into the Chinese market, though I can appreciate it for historical value at the very least. And yeah, uh, Song at Midnight. It. I will say the prints I managed to find were all in desperate need of a restoration. The the blacks are a bit too dark in terms of the composition. The 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 visual mixing can be a bit muddy in the certain the particular transfers they made. But overall, it's not a bad film, and indeed, some of the musical choices made outside of the main songs were quite interesting. It, it almost seemed like proto Fantasia in that on the soundtrack you have slightly up-tempo versions of not only Night on Bald Mountain, but also The Sorcerer's Apprentice, as well as Rhapsody in Blue at some interesting moments, so very much cribbing from the ideals that uh, Walt Disney would crib to just a few short years later. Hell, he was probably in production of Fantasia during this time, because God knows how long the production of those films actually took uh, without the proper paperwork to prove it anyway. But yeah, Song at Midnight. It's available on YouTube in various uh, copies of okay quality. You can tell what's going on, but it's not as clear and crisp as uh, a preservationist of my particular filmic nature would prefer. But that will wrap us up for the second to last title, and that brings us to the final title on this penultimate episode of Retro Culture's Hooptober Tapes Volume Ocho. And that will be 1964's Oni Baba, directed and written by Kaneto Shindo, and starring the talents of Nobuko Otawa, Jitsuko Yoshimura, Kei Sato, and Jukichi Ono. The story of Oni Baba takes place in the 14th century of Japan during a particular civil war. A middle-aged woman and her daughter-in-law survive in a hut, surrounded by a field, a sea of reeds, if you will, taking their wares by killing wandering soldiers and warriors to trade their possessions to a local flea merchant for food. When their recent uh, deserter neighbor, Hachi, defects from the war and returns home, they learn that the middle-aged woman's son and... The daughter-in-law's husband, Kichi, died while stealing supplies from farmers to the north. Soon, taking advantage of their lonesomeness, Hachi seduces the young widow, and she sneaks out of the hut each night to have uh, sex with him. When the older woman discovers the affair of her daughter-in-law, she first attempts to seduce Hachi herself, but unfortunately he's not interested, and... Afterward, she pleads with Hachi to leave the young woman with her since she would not be able to kill the warriors without her daughter-in-law's help. However, Hachi patently ignores this request and continues to meet with the young woman at night. One night, while alone, the middle-aged woman is approached by a samurai wearing a demon mask who demands she guide him out of the Field of Reeds, during which she lures him to a pit where she drops the body of her victims, where he falls to his death. Recovering his possessions, she realizes how the mask could aid her in putting, potentially, a fear of hell into her daughter-in-law's new relationship, and a weird revenge play begins to take form. Now, Onibaba is a film I have been circling for many, many, many years. It is a film whose... Uh, central image, that of a figure clad in the demon mask, that is the source of the titular Onibaba. I've been aware of this practically since the beginning of last decade. It's popped up on a lot of iconic horror lists, not just that of Asian horror, but just horror in general. 
and it caught my interest. And so I decided this was the year I was finally going to watch the darn thing. So I put it on the Hooptober list to just guarantee that I would have a reason to talk about it. And indeed I do. And I was actively unready for how horny this movie was going to be. This movie just seeps uh, lust coming from the corners of the screen, especially when it concerns the, the two younger characters, the central crux of the film, that of the daughter-in-law and uh, Hachi, played by Kei Sato and Jitsuko Yoshimura as the adulterer and adulteress, respectively. Even though that's not technically adultery, seeing as the husband in question uh, died in the middle of the war. So technically she's available right now, but there's just some weird emotional complications that add in those pleasant little wrinkles that want us to take into account in a story like this. Just, I found myself oddly relating to the maternal figure, seeing as I have also found myself to be relatively murderously horny during, uh, even before the pandemic began, and uh, now watching it, it's like, mm, yeah, honey, same, mood. Sheriff, sure, you think mood. That's basically what I got away with watching this. Uh, even though the... This is a film that really doesn't... Really, uh... Could be hard-pressed to be labeled a horror film until the final stretch. Because most of this is really just a war drama. This is a historical film. First and foremost. And the mildly supernatural... And even the mildly supernatural elements only really come into play in the final bit once the samurai with the demon mask appears. And even then, it's more... It's it's barely on the spooky scale in that it's more, like, moody and uh, mildly in te mildly tense. Which is, is, is an aspect of horror still, but... Ah, it, this is it definitely a slow burn of a film. The movie just has so much thirst in it. The, these are people who have craved interaction with quality interaction with another person for so long, and once it's within grasp, some grasp it, and some are left clawing at the edges wanting their share. And that is what causes such of the strife in this film towards the latter half. Uh, hell, once the mask comes into question, uh, it, it basically becomes a fable. Up until, like, the final ten minutes when the the irony and karma comes back into play. And even then, it sort of ends on a mildly ambiguous note. There is a, a final chase that leaves up to viewer interpretation of what exactly happens in the last moments. And... This movie is actually very inspiring in a sense. I actually, watching it, I actually got inspired to reach out to... Uh, Someone I know online who who writes and puts them an idea that I think they might be able to run with. But it's because I, I, I work well as an ideas man, not very much as a publisher. I am I have trouble coming up with any idea to write anything. I just wish I could get paid for just putting forth ideas in meetings and having a producer credit. That's sort of my my love for literary ideas coming in. But it is interesting that this was labeled uh, upon release in America as the most daring film import ever from Japan. And it is interesting to look at this given how erotic and psychosexual this movie is playing for the most part. This movie came out in 1964. Uh, the Hayes Code was still clawing to the remnants of cultural society at this point. So this film, which has a remarkable amount of topless nudity in it, I'm saying there's at least up to upwards of two minute segments and there's multiple of them where the two main women are is just fully topless in their little hut and is moving around and I'm like when did this come out hold on like I because I I am quite aware of the history of sensuality and specifically that of uh, allowed nudity on uh, film screens since well like I said I have have uh, <laughs> I have quite the thirsty streak in my uh, appetites. And the interesting thing is that this came out three years before a notorious cultural milestone that broke a lot of taboos, that being the uh, 
a Swedish film, I Am Curious Yellow, which came out in 1967. This film had quite a bit more nudity in that regard. It, granted, you, there's very little in terms of, like, full frontal. There's, like, distanced shots that that leave much up to the mind to fill in. The only real gross amounts of nudity are just topless scenes, and that's just two women just lying about in a hot bed on probably a really hot day slash really steamy night trying to deal with their own business. And it's, it's, it's interesting it's a cultural milestone in that regard. I find this movie incredibly rewarding, even if I'm actually surprised it didn't hit me harder. Granted, it, it hit aspects of me harder than I thought it would, but overall, the, the package is still well-crafted and really a fine, fine film that I believe is definitely worth sharing and exploring. So actually, I'm just going to leave it there. I I feel this movie is definitely worth checking out. It's it's part like moral fable, part like erotic historical film, and all really impressive. I feel I need to search out more from this director, Kane Toshin, though. What else is he notable for? Oh, he did Kuroneko, the other mid-late 60s Japanese key story that I've been circling around for a long time. If you are perhaps interested in streaming uh, a copy of Onibaba, it is available online to stream in very good quality on both the HBO Max platform as well as the Criterion channel. Check it out. It is quite freely available. This particular film fulfills the second full horror film on my Hooptober listicle. So I managed to cut through one haunted house film, two count them. Two films from 1981. One of the films from the year I was born, as well as one of the remaining Asian horrors on my list. And also a film from the final decade in my rundown, the 1930s. I, I did pretty well. I'm actually proud of myself. I am recording this and finishing editing this at 11.58 on October 31st. I just made it. Granted, I still have to talk about the movies I watched with my bestie, Tyler. That will be coming very, very soon. I'm going to put some effort into scheduling this, hopefully before mid-November. He just got a new job, so I have to work around that schedule. But don't worry, it is coming. And hopefully there will be more talks in the future. There are certain topics that my personal friend group is disagreeing about that might make for interesting discussions. Pre-year in review talk which is guaranteed. I appreciate you took your time to listen to this, and I hope you had a most rewarding spooky season. Uh, this is Brett, the voice without body, hoping you had the spookiest Halloween.